I want to welcome everyone to the University of Dayton, the Human Rights Center, the Women's Center, and the Women's Center uh, Gender and Studies Program to our third installment of our four session series, Gender, Science, and Human Rights. My name is Shelley Inglis, Executive Director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Dayton. And I'm starting by thanking our co-sponsors, the AAAS Science and Human Rights Coalition and the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub at USAID, the world's preeminent bilateral development organization. My particular appreciation to Professor Jamie Small, who has organized this series as part of her AAAS fellowship with USAID's Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub. This event series brings together the government, academic, multilateral, and nonprofit sectors to address some of the world's most pressing issues. We promote utilizing a scientific approach to examine gender equalities and human rights. We are pleased to host a series of conversations that address some of our most pressing global problems with sharply rising social inequalities and recent challenges to the legitimacy of science, we are in desperate need of measured dialogue. Today's conversation is on sustainability, broadly conceived to include environmental and economic dimensions. It spotlights insights from government experts, academics, and advocates who are doing innovative work to make the world a better place. As many of you know, a broad conception of sustainability was embraced globally in 2015 when the world's governments came together to agree to the Sustainable Development Agenda 2030. That framework consists of 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as they're called, which cover the social, environmental, and economic, as well as gender dimensions of development. It reflects a paradigm shift in development to be a universal agenda outlining goals applicable to developed and developing countries alike. It is grounded in scientific approaches with a measurement methodology, including targets and indicators to measure progress. And it deeply integrates human rights issues with gender equality and women's empowerment firmly grounded throughout the goals and in its own goal five. We are now in the decade of action to reach the SDGs and are far from achievement. Even before the global pandemic, the world was not on track. And now the UN forecasts that the pandemic will push 71 million people back into extreme poverty in 2020 in what will be the first rise in global poverty since 1998. The far reaching consequences of the pandemic and the struggles that we have been facing in gender equality, women's rights, addressing climate change and environmental degradation in inequalities in wealth, income, and in the economy are some of the issues that our amazing group of experts are going to discuss with us today. Our audience is comprised of undergraduate students and graduate students, academics from the University of Dayton and beyond, community activists, international development practitioners, and more. And we're very excited to have such a diverse range of individuals in our conversation and audience today. Thank you again for coming. And I will now pass to our moderator and organizer, Jamie Small. Thanks so much, Shelley, for those opening remarks. It's a wonderful framing for the this third dialogue in the gender science and human rights series. And as someone with such an extensive background in the human rights field, it's truly an honor to have you open this conversation. I also want to thank you and your team at the Human Rights Center for supporting this roundtable series. When we first started brainstorming ideas last August, I don't think we could have imagined how wonderful and restorative it would feel to be in this conversation here in March with such amazing and committed individuals. So thank you. 
And also a special note of appreciation to your graduate and undergraduate student assistants who have done so much work behind the scenes to make this happen. Becca Westfall, Bailey Johnson, and Claire Polecki. And also a special thank you to our co-sponsors and champions at USAID, um, and specifically the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub, and specifically Che Shinoy, Deanna Prieto, Natalie Levenberg, and Coco Zuberi. Cheers to all. I'll be moderating the conversation today. My name is Jamie Small, and I'm coming to this role wearing two different hats. One is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Dayton here in Ohio, and one as a gender-based violence advisor at the US Agency for International Development. I'm working at USAID for the year through the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship Program. In my own research, I study law and sexual violence in the US context. But one of the things that I've most enjoyed about my fellowship work these past six months is learning about the innovative gender work that folks in fields far um, from my own are undertaking. As Shelley noted, today we're gonna to be discussing sustainability and we're coming at it from two different angles. So both environmental justice and women's economic empowerment. At first glance, these might seem like distinct concerns. However, when we scratch the surface, we begin to see how deeply intertwined they are. The negative impacts of climate change and unpredictable natural disasters often disproportionately impact women and girls and other vulnerable populations. Too often, we see that when their communities are fractured by environmental harms, women and girls experience increased caregiving and economic responsibilities, as well as shocks to ordinary life rhythms. In turn, women's and girls' economic precarity can leave them exposed to adverse outcomes, such as disrupted educational attainment, child early and forced marriage, food insecurity, and gender-based violence. Moreover, such outcomes can have reverberating effects across a lifetime and span across generations. And if nothing else, the COVID-19 pandemic illuminates the connections between our social, economic, and environmental systems. Before we get started, I do want to acknowledge today the eight people almost all women in Atlanta who were killed earlier this week and yet another mass shooting. Among many other lessons that we seem to be collectively incapable of learning, it is a stark reminder of just how vulnerable women in the marketplace still are, especially those who are migrants, racial minorities, or engaging in sexualized labor. So there is, without any shadow of a doubt, much work and reckoning for us still to do. As Shelley noted, we're a diverse audience today. Um, and in order to, to reach everyone, our conversation is going to be a bit less technocratic and a bit less programmatic, although we do certainly hope that you'll get a strong sense of the amazing work that these panelists have been doing for many years now. But we're going to focus a bit more on a conversation from the heart to see what drives these committed advocates and to see what insights unfold as they have the opportunity to engage with one another in ways that in the before times we would have never had the opportunity to do because these are folks coming from a really diverse range of fields and backgrounds and it's almost certain that they would have never had the opportunity to meet up at the same conference or um, in the same city. So I want to turn now to our crew of amazing panelists who, like I said, are just about as interdisciplinary as you can get, which I love. I'm going to let our speakers introduce themselves, but just to give you a broad strokes overview of who you're going to be hearing from today. We've got Anjali Fleury, who is the Women's Economic Empowerment Fund Program Manager at USAID in the Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation. We've got Randy Davis, who is the rep resident representative in Trinidad and Tobago, Aruba, Curacao, and St. Martin at the United Nations Development Program. We've got Kate Oren, who is Senior Gender Program Manager at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Shazia Rahman, Associate Professor of English at the University of Dayton. And thank you, Shazia, for being willing and open to come on a panel um, from that focuses on science. I'm super excited to have a literary critic in the mix today. 
We've also got Farzana Ramzan, Monitoring and Evaluation Specialist at USAID in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And finally, we've got Jabo Shabalala, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Dayton. So I think it goes without saying that we have a remarkable group of panelists today. Each of them brings a unique and important lens to the questions surrounding gender, environment, economic empowerment, science, and human rights that we're going to be engaging with. So I hope you'll give them a warm cheer of welcome from wherever you're joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to make two important points. First, although today's conversation might not be quite as obviously fraught as two weeks ago when we were discussing gender-based violence, we are still going to be uncovering some um, troubling social inequalities. Moreover, we're meeting during a protracted public health crisis and in the aftermath of racial justice protests from last summer, a deeply contentious presidential election, and a subsequent attack on our nation's capital. So, it's a challenging time. And I invite you all from wherever you are to make sure you're taking care of yourselves during this conversation as well as afterwards. Second, if you have questions as we go, please put them in the chat box. We'll be talking with our panelists for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll open it up to a Q&A period and we will work our hardest to make sure we get to all your questions that you might have. So our first two questions that we're gonna um, have the panelists share, we're gonna do round robin style and then we'll go open it up to a more dialogue style. But I wanna make sure that we get everyone's um, voice in the, the virtual room that we're working with and the audience members that you get a good sense of who, um, who's here. So I'd like for our panelists to start by sharing where they are now, their role, their organization, and any recent roles and work that they've done in this area, whether it's environmental justice or women's economic empowerment or some combination of both. And then in our second question, we might meander back in time a bit. But for right now, I'd like you all to introduce yourself um, and where you are now. And we'll start, I think, with Jebo. Hi all, um, and again, thank you to Jamie for putting this all together um, and to Shelley for the support that she's given for this program. Um, my name is Jebo Shabala. Um, I'm an associate professor of law at the University of Dayton School of Law. I primarily do research in intellectual property and overlap between intellectual property and sustainable development which for the past 10 years has mainly meant working on intellectual property and climate change. Um, and most recently, the area that I've been really focused on is thinking through the ways in which when technology flows or is selected to address climate change, how do we do the selection process and how do we assess the impacts in a way that prioritizes um, the beneficiaries of technology being the poorest, the most vulnerable, and that addresses both gender and other human rights uh, elements that way. Um, I've been fortunate that I've had the support from the Human Rights Center here at Dayton to do that work. And I've been involved in climate change negotiations at the UNFCCC for longer than I care to remember. And I will elaborate on that, <laughs> I think, as we go on. Um, but that is sort of the core area of the work I'm doing. Thanks, Jeppo. And I think I'll um, go around our screen. Um, Anjali, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for having me um, on today's panel. I'm really excited to talk to everyone and get to hear more from our, um, our other panelists as well. So uh, as Jamie mentioned, my name is Anjali Fleury. And I recently joined USAID as the program manager for a women's economic empowerment fund that we have. And this work has been ongoing for a long time. Um, and through this fund, we've been able to support nearly 80 projects um, in more than 60 countries. We partner with private sector, non-governmental organizations, local organizations, um, you know, host countries, and obviously um, other parts of the US government to advance women's economic empowerment in a wide variety of ways. And my role in this position is to really bring together our activities in a very cohesive and strategic way because women's economic empowerment can be um, involved in so many different sectors. And 
case, and the challenges um, and expertise that's needed, my role kind of helps bring together our various activities, making sure that we can um, approach them in a holistic manner. And that means looking at our budgets and our, our capabilities um, that Congress has allowed us um, in, in terms of our budget allocation, but then also looking at how do we want to um, strategically focus our activities? What are the, the main pillars of, of approach that we want to take um, with our work? And as I mentioned, I, I'm new to this role. Um, I'm new to working in the federal government, actually. My background is a little different. I'm coming from the UN, specifically um, the International Labor Organization. And as Randy can attest, the UN is a very different type of bureaucracy. It's a very different type of structure in working on these issues. And even though we're all connected through our work, um, the approach sometimes can be a little different. Um, but I'll, I'll explain more about that um, should questions arise on that specifically. But thank you again for having me. I'm excited to, to join this panel. Thanks, Anjali. And since you um, called out Randy, maybe we'll turn to Randy. So thanks a lot. Um, thank you, everybody. I, I'm really delighted to be part of this very diverse panel, and I think it will lead to an interesting um, exchange of thoughts. Um, so my current position here, um, I am resident representative in Trinidad and Tobago for UNDP, which is a large um, global development organization that's working uh, in uh, about 170 countries and territories. I cover Aruba, Curacao, St. Martin, and Trinidad and Tobago out of this office. Um, and prior to that, I had worked for many years in New York in the gender division of UNDP. I was, uh, last position was director of gender equality for our global work for UNDP. So um, let me just say briefly that, uh, you know, UNDP is a, one of the largest, broadest development agencies for the UN that's working to help countries towards their achievement of the sustainable development goals. And in that context, um, gender equality plays a critical role. Um, if we're looking at all of the indicators and, and um, goals themselves and how we get there. So we have a very large task in mainstreaming gender equality in everything that we're doing, whether it's in a portfolio um, related to governance and institution building, whether it's in our environmental programs, or whether it's dealing specifically with issues of gender-based violence, which I just want to say that 10 years ago was not even really on our radar, and it's now one of our largest um, areas of intervention because of the global scale and of the pandemic of gender-based violence and because it's holding so many women um, behind and development behind in general. But I will also say that the portfolio on the um, environment is, is uh, you know, one of our largest areas of intervention right now globally, as we're trying to help countries move to a green economy and where the intersection of gender equality and women's rights work into that transition, I think is going to be a critical aspect of a post COVID recovery. So I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna to have today around these, these particular issues. Thanks, Randy. And I feel like that's a good transition for Kate. Yeah, perfect. No, I, I feel like I need to say very little actually after, after Randy and she's an old friend. It's so nice to be on this panel with her and with all of you. Um, this is a really nice opportunity. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, my name is Kate Oren. I'm Senior Gender Program Manager for IUCN, which is the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, IUCN is the world's oldest and largest environmental authority. Uh, we are an intergovernmental organization, not a UN organization, but in the same circles. <laughs> uh, we're an IGO which means that we have really diverse state and non-state members, civil society organizations of all shapes and sizes, including indigenous people's organizations are who we are, our membership. Um, we convene the members uh, every four years in the World Conservation Congress, which essentially through a, a democratic and participatory process forges the conservation agenda. Um, IUCN is very well known for things like the Red List, which is the, the, the sort of authority on, on uh, threatened species, the, the, the largest uh, 
source of information for uh, biodiversity, uh, flora and fauna, and animals of all kinds. Um, but IUCN, I think, and, and the reason that I came to IUCN is because it takes um, a very particular approach understanding that people are a part of ecosystems, for better or worse, often for the worse. <laughs> and we try to advance and champion and promote and pick apart all the problems of why it's not working yet, but we try to forge a rights-based gender responsive approach, understanding that women and men in all their diversity um, use and control and benefit from natural resources in very, very different ways and contribute to environmental degradation and instability in different ways and benefit from response mechanisms. I can't believe we don't know each other yet, Jebo. I've also spent much too much time in UNFCCC halls. Um, and uh, that's my story. So I, I'm part of the genders team um, at IUCN. We sit underneath the global program on governance and rights, which focuses on governance, as the name implies, and the rights and uh, priorities and positions of indigenous peoples and women's empowerment and gender equality, working really closely with women's major groups, women's networks, women's cooperatives of all sizes around the world, and trying to continuously convince our, our partners of, of all shapes and sizes that gender matters and women's rights matters. And unless we get those things right, we won't get any of our environmental goals right. Thanks, Kate. Farzana? Hi, everyone. I'm Farzana Ramzan. I am with the US Agency for International Development, the same agency um, that Anjali is also a part of. So super excited to meet her as a result of this panel. Um, and I'm currently serving as a senior monitoring and evaluation specialist in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Um, I'm in the Analysis and Learning Division. And um, a lot of what I do is um, I, I partner with the Bureau's gender team in the development of gender metrics and data use. And specifically, I manage the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which um, we may get a chance to talk about a little bit more later today. Um, I provide analysis and learning support for the Bureau's Inclusive Development Division, which includes not only gender, but youth um, as well. Uh, I also oversee global partnerships that aim to strengthen national data systems in our partner countries. Um, and more recently, I work with university partners and researchers uh, to explore the ways in which innovative technologies, data, and methods can help us better understand food security and achieve our development objectives. Um, specifically in the area of gender data, um, we really hope that by using some of these data that our team and our partners have supported and developed um, can really drive decision making um, where partners, partner governments um, feed the future, which was President Obama's global food security and hunger initiative, and which is now part of the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. Uh, we're hoping some of these data can really help advance women's empowerment um, in areas where traditionally women have faced significant barriers to inclusion. Um, so with an eye to the future, we're really hoping that governments also begin using gender indicators in their national surveys and to continue to track and respond to women's needs and constraints in the agriculture sector. Thanks, Rosanna. And Shazia, who's bringing a very different way of understanding the world to the mix. Well, I have to say, it's such an honor to be here in your company and to be on a panel with you all. But um, I think Jamie's right, because I'm much more of a thinker. <laughs> so um, I'm a, I teach literature in the English department at the University of Dayton. Um, and the reason I'm saying that I'm much more of a thinker is because I spend a lot of time uh, with students uh, talking about novels and talking specifically about issues of environment issues, gender issues, uh, as we read these novels and, and thinking about how stories get told and, and how that matters because it affects the way we think about these things and, um, and that you have to really 
truly imagine something better before you can actually make it happen. So I'm in the sort of imagine part, <laughs> the early part, uh, if we can imagine it, <clears throat> that can help. Um, in terms of my work, uh, yeah, a lot of it is with students recently. I uh, in 2019, I, I published a, a book, Place and Postcolonial Ecofeminism. In 2020, I published an article on uh, postcolonial eco-masculinity. Uh, so I guess that what that really means is that I spend a lot of time thinking about gender and thinking about how, uh, how gender affects the environment. And, and yeah, so in a nutshell, uh, that is what I'm doing right now. Thank you, Shazia. And again, thanks for being here. I think um, it's so nice to get a different framework in terms of it, where everyone's coming at it. And especially in international development, there's so much focus on metrics and quantification of the human landscape and data and you know, kind of data big D. And so I, I think bringing in this, a literary perspective to think about there, and understand the, the interdisciplinary way that we can understand the world. And I think that the, the note that you made um, about we have to imagine something different first is so powerful. Um, so thank you for being in the mix. Thank you for all for being here and giving your time. You have, you're an extraordinary group who's done so much. So I'm really excited to hear more about how we might use evidence, data, and just thinking, imagining, and where that, that interface between science and imagining might happen to um, help alleviate some of the, the persistent um, and troubling inequalities that we're seeing in relation to gender in particular. So our second question um, is, I'd like for each of you to tell me the origin story of your career. You're all in positions quite high level um, now where you're contributing in one way or the other to the improvement of the common good um, and I'm assuming that what has driven you to your career and your work is something more than just money or status, that there, there's been some galvanizing force over the course of your career as a younger person that pushed you in this direction. So I'm wondering if you could share one or two tidbits, anecdotes from your younger years, or it could be more recent too, that has motivated you um, and pushed you to invest so much time and energy in this work you're doing, whichever area you're doing it in. Um, what was the spark that made you feel like I gotta, I gotta do something about whatever the thing is that you're focused on? Um, and again, I think we'll um, let's start with Jebo and then we'll go around to hear some some of the origin stories of your careers. Oh God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to out myself as a geek. Um, I always wanted to work for the UN. Ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to work for the UN. Growing up in Botswana and South Africa, the presence of the UN was an almost unalloyed good, right? UNDP in particular, the presence of UNDP was an unalloyed good. Uh, we saw them everywhere. We saw their trucks everywhere. And they represented an idea that I just, I just wanted to be. And so I was going to be a company man. I went through high school, I went through exchange programs. I, uh, I came to law school in the US. Um, I went and did the uh, entrance exam um, and didn't get in at P1, but by sheer dint of luck ended up in Geneva at the South Center uh, in an internship and then a fellowship um, and I learned hard lessons about how intergovernmental organizations work. Uh, <laughs> I learned, including the one with, about how leadership can make an entire organization run or function or fail. And as an, as I think as a, as a young, ambitious, but also very naive person, I hitched my wagon to the leadership and said, okay, what do you need to be done? And I did it and I was on the wrong side of the history. And so when the chance came to jump ship to a partner NGO, Center for International Environmental Law, I jumped ship. Um, right, I was working on intellectual property and access to medicines. The work was amazing. And so I was able to move to an NGO to do that. And I loved it. Um, the freedom, uh, the sense of um, agency, the sense of 
being right at the co-face of the work, even though it was in Geneva, you know, staying up until 10, 11, 12 a.m. at meetings at, at the World Fleshing Property Organization, at the WTO, um, going to the dump at the offices of the WMO, it was magical for somebody like me who come all the way from Botswana to do that kind of thing. And I and I loved it. Um, but as you all know, burnout happens fairly quickly, even in that situation. And I love doing the work. And I love working the cold face and doing the sort of technical assistance work that that involves advisory work and lobbying and technical assistance and feeling valued. And that was wonderful. But I had no time to think, right? I was doing a lot, but I had no time to think. And so when the chance came to get an academic job, um, I, again, luck, I got a job at, in Maastricht in the Netherlands teaching there, um, teaching intellectual property and, and in the intellectual property and sustainable development area. And it turned out that I loved teaching um, and I wasn't terrible at it, so that was great too. Um, <laughs> and that's when I think I found something that made the right balance between sort of being able to teach, but continue to be active, be able to teach, sort of stand back, think a little bit, then come in and sort of work on the application, then stand back a little bit, and then come in and work on the application. And because I was always in this weird, obscure field of intellectual property that not everybody had in-house expertise on, they will pull us into things that were happening at the UNDP, things that were happening at UNFCCC, Things that were happening at UNCTAD, things that were happening in different organizations where they're like, so can you tell us more about how IP intellectual property and access to knowledge intersect with what we're doing here? And I'd come in and we talk about it. And then there'd be like a burst of energy and work and it would slow down. And then we'd go to another venue where the issue had come up, conventional biological diversity, and we'd end up there. And it's how I ended up at the UNFCCC because that issue of intellectual property and access to knowledge came up there and kept going, kept going, kept going, and hasn't ended yet. <laughs> and so I have been doing that plus academia ever since. Thank you, Jebo, for sharing your origin story. And since you also brought up the idea of thinking, I think I'll, I'll turn to our other um, professor in the bunch, Shazia, who also um, mentioned thinking. Okay, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I had a real hard time with this. And I was trying to come up with, uh, and like Jevo, I was thinking about, well, I should talk about my career. And then I realized that the one thing that has not really changed for me, like throughout my life, is that I've always been a feminist. And I started really thinking about how, how did that happen? Um, and, you know, when people ask me, I always say, well, my mom's a feminist. She's a diehard feminist. I really couldn't have been anything else. But I realized in thinking about it recently that um, I, I was pretty young. I was a, a child who would got, came, to the, came to the realization that I really would not want to be a girl anymore because girls were limited. And in my particular situation, I was, they were trying to limit me from climbing trees. <laughs> I spent a lot of my childhood climbing trees with male cousins, right? I had a male cousin in Pakistan. I had another male cousin in Germany. And whenever I would visit, we would climb trees in the backyard, like not like in forests or anything, but, and I think that that was, uh, sort of the origin of my feminism is becoming slowly aware at a very young age, like seven, eight, nine years old, that the way in which I was told to get off that tree and come inside was very different, <laughs> very different. And so, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think about gender, I think about trees a lot. <laughs> um, but I think that it started at actually a very young age. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Shazia. And um, it's very apropos for a week when we're talking about the environment, the trees. Farzana, do you want to go next? 
Sure, I'm really glad uh, you asked me to go next because it, my experience is very similar in some ways. Well, well, different, but but there are parallels um, to Shazia's experience. Um, from a very young age, um, uh, my mother was raised without a mother, and my father was raised without a father. Um, so it wasn't until I was an adult that I was really able to kind of make some sense out of how that impacted my own life and shaped my career eventually. Um, so both my parents were born and raised in Tanzania. I'm a first generation American. Um, so when I think about traditional gender stereotypes, they were very much uh, reversed in my own household growing up. Like my father was extremely empathetic, uh, was a caregiver for his own mother um, in her old age. Um, and I really felt very empowered to be able to do anything that I wanted. And, and I, I did um, do whatever I wanted, much to my parents' chagrin at many times. Um, but uh, I, you know, I traveled to Tanzania for the first time in my 20s um, and was able to sort of witness firsthand what it must have been like for my parents growing up. Uh, and you know, I, I think everyone can relate when you sort of have that moment where it's like, wow, yeah, I really did have it much better than my parents did in some very fundamental ways. You know, I always assumed that because they were empowered in my sort of young, you know, youthful, naive self, that you know, because I was empowered, they were empowered. Um, and, and in some respects that might be true, um, but in some very fundamental ways, their quality of life living in a lower income country was far more challenging than I ever imagined until I was actually there. Um, and so that really shaped my own career. You know, I could talk about this all day. I was really glad you asked that question because you know, like Shazia, I was just like, how did I get here? <laughs> um, I actually, you know, speaking to what I, you know, doing what I wanted to do, my undergrad was um, in writing for uh, film and television, actually, and documentaries. And, and that was really, you know, my passion, I thought, in my college life, my college self. Um, you know, I interned at the Cannes Film Festival. Eventually, I ended up interning at the UN also <laughs> um, about, you know, seven years later. So really just took a turn after that trip uh, to Tanzania. Um, but my work really reflects now my fundamental belief um, in a common humanity, in shared values, and a genuine desire to serve and engage in public service, which is, you know, also rooted in my religious identity um, and, and social justice. And I know, Jamie, we've talked about this quite a bit um, with our sort of background in sociology, eventually for me. Um, but uh, just that everyone deserves equal rights and opportunities. And I you know, I always thought that was the case until I realized that wasn't. Um, so that's a little bit about me and, and my motivation uh, for doing what I'm doing now. Awesome, thanks Rosanna. I also love your interdisciplinary background. It's great. <laughs> Kate, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sure. And sorry, I keep turning my video off. My fierce feminist six-year-old keeps trying to make an appearance in this in this conversation, um, as usual. Um, I mean, I think it's funny, actually, that I, I have a feeling many of us thought we were such oddballs in our in our origin stories. And why were we coming to this panel? And, you know, we've we've all taken these these different paths. Um, all very much true. And yet a lot of commonalities because I think I'm the only person at IUCN with a degree in theater. <laughs> and my background is also English literature and theater and performance arts. And I spent the beginning of my professional life doing the weirdest theater ever imaginable. Um, but what I really loved about, you know, I, I feel like I will always be grounded in and, and really motivated by the arts. It, it's my passion. Um, and I think it's because I love people. I love character driven stories and stories of change and what makes people do what they do and how do those stories tap into your audience. And it is very clear to me now, but it did take me 20 years to connect the dots that it is the same thing that I love about what I do now, which is policy work, which is advocacy work and trying to convince people to do things a little bit differently and think just a little bit differently and put on those different glasses and see the world just a little bit differently. It's the same thing as putting a play on and trying to tap into the energy of the audience and trying to meet people where they are and shift what they're feeling in that moment. Um, 
there are a lot of different ways that my my professional life developed and it, it, it was sort of like this for a long time and if I can tell any of the students on this line and I apologize if I'm saying the wrong thing with their professors on the line it's okay to mess up and it's okay to take 10 years to take different turns it is as important to figure out what you don't want to do as it is to figure out what you do want to do um, I did figure out what I wanted to do when I had an incredible opportunity in my 20s ish uh, to live in a very different context in a very different kind of a, a, a village, a very, very, very rural and remote place where gender issues and environment issues were inescapable. They were so intimately linked and I had always been a women's rights activist in my teen years and everything and an environmental activist, but I never, ever, ever imagined that you could have a job doing those things together. So it was, it was, honestly was kind of like a, a kick in the stomach or a slap in the face or something to sort of have that awakening. But 20 years later, here I am, and um, I was very glad to have that aha moment. Thanks, Kate. I And I promise I didn't put these dots together, but you're all like the perfect mapping of like theater and arts and who, who would have thought? <laughs> I was an English undergrad, so there we go. Um, I'll turn to you, Randy. Thanks a lot. Um, I, you know, I just want to pick up on a few of the strands that have come out of this um, that I always tell students um, or younger people. One is that careers, when you look back, are so not linear. It's very, at least the careers that we have in the international development arena, for sure, are very much like Kate was saying. I mean, you do one thing and you kind of weave your way over. I thought Jibbo's example was exactly um, in indicative of that. So I, you know, you, one thing I really tell people is you kind of go with your gut at some point, um, opportunities present themselves, and you just know, if it's something that's the right fit for you. Um, of course, you train in a direction that you're interested in. Um, but ultimately, you know, you, you really could end up anywhere, it's very hard to forecast at, you know, 30 years back where you're going to end up. So it's, it's, an it's an interesting thing to look back actually on where you started. Um, I will say that I started my undergraduate career studying math and philosophy, um, logical reasoning. And in fact, I was going to go into law. That was the sort of next step. And I ended up taking a gap year and I traveled through Africa. And I realized that for me, um, doing something in, in, at the time, international development um, and, and something that was very purposeful was very important to me. And I think that what I see a lot of now with younger people is this notion of being purpose-driven is very important and I think it's great. Um, I think there are many different fields now where you can get purpose and, and feel um, fulfilled and even remunerated with purpose. Um, so I studied development economics and from development economics, it's very interesting how my career wove. I was very lucky to be recruited right out of grad school into the UN. It's it's almost unheard of. Um, and my first job was in Bangladesh, which was a shock. I was, I think, 23 or 24, um, very young. I was sent to Bangladesh for two years. Um, and really, I was faced with very stark poverty portfolios and really the um, that's when my, you know, I was actually educated as a feminist from um, Bengali feminists, my colleagues at work. And it was not just by seeing, you know, what you really need your eyes open to feminism to see what's around you, in fact. Otherwise, you can be very easily led. I was working on an urban development portfolio, and all of my technical advisors were, for the most part, men very technical. So you were looking at technical solutions to what are social problems. Um, when you start to see that the problems are not technical, it's not how uh, a latrine is produced. It's, it's who has power in the family over or in the community over access to the latrine that counts, um, that you start to awaken to 
the fact that that these inequalities, and I won't even say gender inequalities, there are discrimination and inequalities pervade and power relations sort of pervade every um, analysis you need to do to see how we get to a better space for the future. So I could go on and tell you how my career meandered, um, but in brief, you know, I went from serving 10 years in urban development in Asia to working on um, governance programs. That's where I met Shelley um, for UNDP. And from governance really became very passionate about women, women's political participation, which, and women in decision-making. Um, and from there entered into, um, into gender, you know, being in the gender directorate. Uh, working on environmental issues, really, I had a great foundation from those years in Bangladesh. That was, you know, things really, you know, it's those lens and, and, and those issues which really haven't changed. And I really, I really want to um, encourage people to find, you know, when you find passion and purpose, you will have no problem. I mean, yes, the burnout's there, but generally you can sustain a lot of burnout when the purpose and passion are there. Um, and nowadays with social media and the need to be out there and have your name out there and Twitter and blogging and what have you, you can even bring a lot of this thinking into the doing. I mean, there's a lot, it, it's a new world out there and there's so much opportunity for to, to almost have a lot of different options no matter what you choose. So, so I just, this is very interesting to hear how people are moving. Um, but I think these are some of the common takeaways. Thanks, Randy. Anjali? Yeah, thanks. These are all, your stories, I think, resonate with me so much. I, it's true, like our upbringing, who we, who we were at a young age and the stories that we experienced back then have shaped who we are. And yeah, it's not always linear, but um, you, know, you, can, you can look back at different pinpoints in your life and see how they've shaped you to become the person that you are and, and to get you to the career that you're in now. And for me, my story is somewhat similar to, to some of you. My mother is um, from a very small, very poor village in India. And it's kind of just through a weird circumstance that she met my father and ended up um, immigrating to the US. And um, big parts of my childhood were spent in her small village. Big parts of my childhood were spent in Austin, Texas, which had a very different feel than her village. And I think growing up and seeing, seeing different perspectives, having a very multicultural upbringing, understanding different cultures, understanding what poverty looks like in different places, um, what culture looks like in different places. And for me as a, as a multiracial person, understanding race and identity um, in different ways and how I fit in or didn't fit in in the US, how I fit in or didn't fit in in India and other cultures really shaped my understanding of intersectionality at a very young age. <laughs> and, um, and that also influenced me in terms of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a girl in different cultures um, and how that role suddenly changed depending on where I was. And um, you know, I, I, think, I think all of these experiences as a child, unbeknownst to me, kind of shaped that I knew I wanted to do something to work on these issues. I knew I wanted to help people and work on equality and justice. Um, didn't quite know what that looked like. And in fact, I didn't really know about the UN at, at a young age. Um, at first I wanted to be a social worker. So I went to school, uh, my undergraduate, I got degrees in social work, government and communications and um, started off my career as a social worker. And I worked in the public housing complex. I worked with immigrants and refugees and I worked with survivors of domestic violence and gender-based violence. And I loved the work. It was very rewarding. I felt like I was doing something meaningful with my time. I was really helping people. I could see the difference I was making. But for me, I also felt a struggle that every person I saw every day was dealing with the same issues in, in many ways. And there was this want and desire on my part to, to address the root causes. And that's kind of what propelled me into more of the policy, more of the macro level work. Um, so I got a master's degree in public policy and ended up working in international organizations with UN Women, with the World Bank, with international labor organization primarily in Southeast Asia um, for the last handful of years, um, working as a, a gender regional advisor um, with the International Labor Organization on migration and labor rights um, within, the, within the gender context. And um, you know, now looking at things from this macro level 
at the policies and the broad programming, I kind of miss more of like the micro level where you can really see the impact that you're making. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I've learned in this process is like all of these roles play together and are very important and interconnect. And you need people on the ground, you need people at the policy level, you need the political will, and you need people who are implementing it on the ground. And where we fit into that, you know, might change over time, but um, depending on what our what our passion or our drive is, but um, but all those positions kind of work together, and and I I feel I've had uh, the ability to kind of work in those variety of positions as well, um, which has been very helpful. So that's kind of how I got to where I am today. Thanks, Anjali. And. If you're in the audience listening, feel free to pop questions in the chat and we can address those um, as they come up. I, I wanna ask you all, um, it seems like one of our big threads that have come up in almost each of your career origin stories is a, a theme of boundary crossing and imagery and, and but then moving across boundaries, whether it's communities, nations or different social spaces that informed your, your understanding of yourself in the world and also how you um, make sense of, of evidence and knowledge and science. So I'm wondering if anyone has any thoughts on what those boundary crossings and identity spaces and the, the shifting identities you hold and how they connect and are relational to the, the other spaces you're in and moving through, how those um, things have shaped your your pursuit of knowledge and your understanding of science and how we make sense of the world. I think we're all pausing to think this through because it is I'll a very good reflect. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's either like in the classroom, like that silence either means that the question was like a total random oddball, makes no sense, <laughs> or people just need a moment to reflect and think about it. You can tell me if it, if it was the latter or the former. <laughs> Maybe I'll jump into the silence to um, not, not, I mean, not directly to your question, but when you asked us to reflect prior to the panel a little bit on, on science or data evidence, I, I really, I want to talk to that point specifically when we talk about um, gender inequality or, or inequalities again, in general. Um, a lot of what we, you know, what you're trying to do is change minds of policymakers, politicians, um, people who can make a difference to people's lives, direct resources, change laws and policies. It's a lot of what we're doing, um, e either you locally or, or us internationally. And, um, and there are two ways to do it, right? You deal with, you, you appeal to the emotional side, with it, which is why storytelling is a very compelling um, mechanism or, or you know, attaching to someone's personal experience. Um, and then the other is of course, dealing with their interests, right? You appeal to, What's the interest? What does he care about? What usually does he care about? Um, so, so what will what will sway people? I mean, the fact that gender-based violence um, or 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 even just gender inequality um, hurts a woman or is not fair is not a compelling argument to mm -hmm. most of the power holders, or it would have been changed by now. So, you need to find the evidence to convince those people in a language that they understand, and that. That has been a huge shift, I think, in the last decade, where we're starting to unearth the evidence of how to persuade um, people by showing that if you invest this much in um, women's economic empowerment, this is the outcome for the economy overall. If you close gender pay gaps, this is the outcome. And I think now that we are talking about um, COVID recovery, this is going to be a huge area because if we leave, I, I mean, I'm talking about the gender issues, but you can apply it across many, but women have been hit hard by the pandemic. And if we don't address the specific um, inequalities and in ways in which they've been hit by the pandemic through the way that we're now reinvesting in stimulus packages in the economies, 
um, we are going to not maximize the potential to recover faster. So those are the, not the arguments I favor. And I was it um, Hillary Clinton who said, you know, gender equality is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Unfortunately, that evidence is necessary to convince people who have other interests at heart. And, um, and we are seeing it be very effective. So the more we unearth it, um, the quicker we can achieve goals. And I would say this would work across if we're advocating for the environment, for example, as well. So we are using argumentation about the potential of green jobs for future growth for countries who have hit it hard by, by the pandemic or um, you know, equality and access to resources, but really data matters. Um, and so I just, I'll throw that in there. Maybe it was my closing remark, but. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think following what Randy said, stories, and actually, Shazi, you mentioned this at the very beginning, stories are so important. And I think we've mentioned in our own origin stories why this work resonates with us. Um, but also Randy is saying how important it is that we can share this narrative with the minds that we're trying to change. And, and so, um, you know, if someone hasn't experienced something or they don't understand what something looks like or the human side of it, it's harder to convince them because they don't have that story themselves. And I think one of the things that we're seeing, bringing it back to environmental justice, one of the problems that we've seen when it comes to talking about issues like climate change is that a lot of times we're talking about something far off in the future. You know, in, in 11 years, it's going to look like this. In 20 years, it's going to look like this. And it's hard sometimes for our human brains to comprehend a different world and to understand a different story of what that could look like if we haven't experienced it ourselves. And so I think that um, these narratives that we're that we're weaving, um, you know, it, it becomes challenging sometimes when it's just the data. You need you need both um, so that people can feel and understand um, the importance and the weight of the work that we're advocating. I think I mean I think that what you're saying is right. We need the data and we need the stories. But I think one of the things that we often don't think about, and this is a problem that I just have, just thinking about the world today. And I was, I think I was talking to my class about it on Tuesday, right? When, when we can't agree on facts, what do we do when we can't agree on what, the, like, yes, so you have this data, what do you do when somebody's response to that data is to say, no, actually you don't. So that's the problem with data. And then there's also a problem with stories because stories help us have empathy for others, right? A story can have us help have empathy for anyone, like anyone, right? So you could end up having empathy for like the com complete opposite. Do you know what I'm, do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right? Like you, like when I teach, uh, I try to choose novels that help my students have empathy for uh, certain people who are living very different lives and who do, they don't think about, right? Like I'm, I'm always trying to get my students to sort of think about the international perspective, like try to imagine uh, what the consequences of your actions here are going to have in a place very far away, right? Um, and, so, and so part of what I'm doing is having them read novels from very far away. Um, but seriously, those same stories are, are being, you can, you can tell any kind of story. So you can tell a story that will lead to somebody, uh, somebody to believe the, the fact that is not a fact, right? And I'm not saying I have any answers for this. Um, I'm just saying that this is a problem. So, and I don't know if you have any answers because you're like out there fighting the good fight and I want to hear from you. <laughs> Well, I don't know um, if you mean, uh, oh, go ahead, Jebo. No, no, please go ahead, Kate. Well, I don't know if you meant us or the audience, but I, I'm just going to jump in. No, I meant my, <laughs> my, so my fellow panelists. I mean, I think the, the fundamental issue is that everything is subjective. Everything is biased, including data and including the stories we tell to both build that data and use that data to influence. Um, you know, there was that saying, somebody said this to me when I was just starting out in a UN meeting, what, 
what matters is what we count and what counts matters, but it, it's all, it's all subjective. Um, I completely agree with you, Randy, that in the last decade, we have seen so much increased attention at nexus issues, at, you know, understanding the importance of talking across sectors, working across sectors, pushing those boundaries. I think we're kind of looping back to your original question here, Jamie, but clumsily, <laughs> you know, that there's an increasing attention on the importance of recognizing those nexus issues like gender and environment, for example. But I think we still have a long, long way to go to think about how we actually met, how, how we see those issues as something measurable and then how we gather that data and communicate it to affect change, change that is driven by real people's lives and that will improve real people's lives. The image that comes to my mind and that we're working on a lot in our in our day to day work is and Shelley and um, introduced this idea at the beginning of the the wheel of the sustainable development goals. Hopefully these are this is a familiar concept to everybody, you know, the interlinked sustainable development goals and the idea that they are they are interlinked and universal. You can't make progress on one sustainable development goal like gender equality without making progress on the others. But the reality is that if you look at all of the measurement metrics of those sustainable development goals and their targets and indicators, there are big glaring gaps. And the big glaring gaps are around the environment focused indicators. If you look at SDGs 14, 15 and, and, and 13, 14, 15 and something else around life on land, life underwater and climate action, there are no gender responsive targets there. There are no linkages. The indices that are looking at progress to meet the SDGs, if they're looking at it from a gender perspective, they just leave blank the environment SDGs and vice versa. So that means then for someone like me, a gender advisor and an advocate working inside an environmental organization that means I don't have a tool to go to my colleagues in the water program, in the forest landscape restoration program, in the climate action program. I don't have anything. I go to them and say, good luck guys, your SDGs are over here and I'll go work on SDG five. That's not gonna work. And it's also not gonna work because of what Randy said, that the impacts of this pandemic have shown us we are rolling backwards. So. Sorry, maybe I'm going a little bit too dramatic here, but I think there has been a lot of progress, but I do think we have some really, really persistent gaps. We have not cracked the code yet on how we actually calculate what, what we believe and what we see as, as change across sectors. You know, one of the things that's been interesting in my experience is the level at which many of us work flattens difference. Right, sort of, sort of begin, sort of move difference around because we have solutions or we have ideas that are meant to either be plug and play, etc. And you know, I, I don't know how many what you guys have struggled with, but this is that with data and evidence, it matters who decides what data to collect. It matters who collects the data, and then it matters who disseminates it. And if it comes from one particular person or set of populations, it's not really data, it's um, folk knowledge, or it's, you know, it's, right, it's not structured in the right way until it's structured by one of us academics, then it becomes sort of, and I've become more and more convinced at least from my particular work that the least, I'm least effective when I come with something already set, and I'm most effective when what I come what 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 will come with is enablement enablement. What do you need in order to achieve your goals? And then listen to what their goals are, etc. And if those and and say okay, my mission relates to these goals. Here's where our mission overlaps, and we can partner and work there, right? And that has been one of the hardest things to sort of come back around to because. I'm a technologist, I'm a solutionist, right? I have solutions that I want to give to people, but almost always it turns out that when it comes to 
groups of people and, and who it only works if they have agency, if they have their own goal, you have to meet their own goals, et cetera. And it's a hard tension because many of these self same communities, I grew up in many of these communities are fundamentally right, filled with gender violence, filled with hierarchies, filled with non-representational sort of power hierarchies and coming in and saying, here, let's, we can work on this thing, but we're not gonna talk about the fact that there are all these terrible power hierarchies going on here. I, I think the, the danger for me is wherever you go, whatever different community you're in, they have to have their own idea and their own mission. You have to live with that and, and work with that. But also change is, tran like, change is transformational. Transformation is unavoidable. And so we can't avoid being transformative whenever we engage with people. And I think, you know, my, my concern has always been about sort of that tension between being transformational, but also living with and acknowledging and respecting people, agency of, of the people whom I engage. Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah, I agree. That was the perfect segue. Um, I work in the data space, so this is like super interesting to me. And I can't, you know, I've already mentioned that I, you know, my background is really in writing and storytelling. So it's this is super interesting. Um, and agency is one of those sort of um, areas that we we measure in in some of the gender metrics uh, work that I talked about earlier at USAID. Um, and so I, I think just kind of weaving the thread also um, it, in terms of crossing boundaries when, you know, that first trip to Tanzania, one of the things that I would always think about is how empowerment is um, conceived of in different spaces, uh, you know, similar to the stories that others have told on this panel, like how, what does it really mean to be empowered in the US versus in Tanzania versus in India versus in, in other spaces? and. This is really something that we try to grapple with when we're measuring and making it a, a measurable concept. Um, and so one of the ways that we have worked through this, and by we, I mean our partners who are, you know, also come from very diverse backgrounds themselves, um, have, have started to try out cognitive testing in, in some of these tools that we um, are, are starting to develop. And what that means is if we think of empowerment from a very sort of Western feminist construct, um, one of those dimensions is leisure time, for example. And leisure time is considered is, you know, through cognitive testing, we learned is, is a very problematic concept in, in different spaces. How do people conceive of leisure? How do people, you know, define their status? What do they consider agency to mean in, in these different spaces? And, and so we've gone through this process many times with um, not just uh, NGOs or uh, governments, but we've, you know, talked to farmers. What does empowerment mean to you? Is it the same thing that it means to us? And we refine the things that we measure and we listen to what um, some of the participants of our programs are, are saying and how they are defining um, agency, instrumental agency, intrinsic agency, collective agency. What does it mean in those spaces and to what extent are they cross-culturally comparable? You know, kind of that flattening that you were talking about, how do we standardize or do we even want to standardize some of these things? Are they very context-driven? So these are really some of the uh, challenging and interesting and, and very personal also questions that a lot of the work that I'm managing now at USAID, ironically, I would have never thought that, but these are some of the questions that we're grappling with and trying to answer um, with our academic partners, with the participants in our programs in the countries where we work, with our government partners, with researchers, with university partners. So it's just, I don't, I don't think we're there yet. We're, we're trying, we're get, you know, we're, we're trying to engage in this dialogue, which in itself is, I think, a form of storytelling. Um, you know, listening to other stories, refining our own stories, asking more interesting questions to get there, um, whatever there might mean in this space. But, um, and, and just kind of circling back to what Randy also said earlier that, you know, there were technical issues, but, you know, there were really social problems and, and now kind of, in this data-driven world that we're in, kind of also pivoting to these social problems and how we also, again, in this data space, find technical solutions to them and in the measurement space um, and in the data space. Like, 
making empowerment a measurable, quantifiable concept is, is just so bizarre to think about, but it's, it's really meaningful and a powerful advocacy tool, if anything. If we don't get the measurement right, we do have some of the tools to be able to advocate for, for some of these important changes in our programming. So um, yeah, super interesting to hear all of the different perspectives on this. Are you gonna jump in there, Anjali? I, was, I just wanted to add one small thing that I think about a lot and would love everyone's take on is when we try to quantify things like social norms, changing gender norms, it's so hard to do that from a data perspective, but it's so critical to our work in women's economic empowerment, in terms of environmental justice, making sure that um, the way that people view women and children, uh, women and girls specifically in the climate change conversations, it's critical to talk about social norms and gender norms. And that's something that doesn't happen right away. It's not so easy, quant easily quantifiable in terms of data. And, you know, in, in development, we talk again and again about how we have to have like this iterative cycle where we like try something and then assess if it's working and then change it. And then, you know, you can measure it in that way. Um, but one of the things I learned in grad school from my professor is, you know, he was talking about Nelson Mandela who was jailed. And, um, you know, if you had looked at his progress in his, in his movement when he was in jail, you would think, well, they haven't been very successful in their attempts. But if you take a 20, 40 year perspective and they were successful, then you think, oh, the, the strategy that they had worked. And so same thing with social norms, these things take time. How do you know that your approach has been successful early on when these things take a long time to change? How do you quantify them? How do you measure them? It's very complicated. So just following what Farzana and everyone has been mentioning is when we're working on um, things from the gender lens, whether it's economic empowerment or environmental justice, um, you know, it's, it's just not so easy to, to approach um, and it's not so easy to quantify. And, and um, yeah, there's just, it's, it's complicated essentially. Randy just messaged me to say she had to run to the airport. So this is why she dropped off. I would, um, Basil put a question in the chat and, I, and we're running short on time, but I did wanna circle it um, into the conversation because I think it's a really important one. And I think um, the, the nugget of what he's asking about is power at the, at the global level of when you have international development organizations in a global context that is deeply unequal and has been for many decades. Um, is it all for naught or is it just reproducing power? Um, apologies, Vassal, if I'm misrepresenting that, but I think that's the core of what he's asking. What, what's your take on this? Like, even with all the best data and with all the best stories, are we reproducing uh, a neo-colonial world order? Yeah, I mean, uh... Like I said before, just like you can have any kind of story uh, that makes you have empathy for anyone, right? And that person could be somebody, you know, uh, that you don't admire. <laughs> you can also have situations where NGOs are doing any kind of work, right? Any kind of work. And it could be an NGO. To assume that an NGO is doing the good work that the government isn't doing uh, is to assume maybe a little too much. And, um, and then of course, there's the issue of the government should do this work. And how do we create a, a system and a structure in which, uh, yeah, the, 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 the system is a system that works. Like, how do you help the system work? Um, I, I have sympathy for Fessel's question, <laughs> but I don't have any answers. I will say one of the breaking points for me was when I realized that all I ever did was talk to government actors, right? Um, I would talk to the Geneva Act, I talked to the ministry, we talked to the sub-ministry, maybe talk to the big national NGO that was affiliated with Climate Action Network. But that measure of uh, sort of, if I was say, if I was like, here's the measure of it, whether there'd be a match by the people in the communities I was talking about, 
to say, yes, that thing you say you are measuring is that same thing that is what I am also seeing or what I'm experiencing, right? Um, and nobody, of course, gives you money to do that survey on the ground, um, right? If you'd be asked, and maybe they shouldn't give it to you, right? In fact, they should, probably shouldn't give it to you. They should give it to the organization on the ground. But I think that that is a really big gap that I struggle with. And I think it replicates simply the power, the access, the information, right? I was always able to get funding, right? Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundation, well, until they stopped funding my work. But <laughs> until that point, right? There was, it was easy to get a hold of the foundations. And you know, I think that was a, a real gap to get to the organization on the ground. We were able to be a filter sometimes to get money to our partner organization on the ground, but we had like our partner. And there were so many organizations on the ground that nobody ever heard from. Um, and I think it would require a very different sense of ourselves as sort of people who work in an NGO realm to think about what our role is, right? To either be pure conduits or to really sort of do what, you know, what other organizations have done, which is go and put your headquarters in, 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 in Addis, go put your headquarters in Joburg, go put your headquarters in Botswana, rather than in London, et cetera. Hire people there and pay them the salary that you pay expats for people who live there rather than pay an expat salary and a non-expat salary, right? There's this whole structure around all of this that I think we could definitely do better and especially around environmental NGOs who have, we have a terrible history on this, could do even better on that. But the money's not on the ground, it's all the way up here and so how does he, you know, somebody has to be the, the one that gets it from up here, down here, and the NGOs have been the one that have been most effective at doing that. But I think it could be done better. Thank you all. That, that was a big question to, to ask with like negative minutes left. <laughs> um, we are running short on time. I would like to give each of you a chance to share one parting thought like a 30 second, what, what do you want folks to remember about, um, about this important work that you're doing? And I, will, um, I won't call on you this time. I'll just let you pop in as, as you um, feel called to. I'll just begin by saying that um, I really think we should, we should think about how to do sustainability work, human rights work, the work that we're doing in a respectful way that involves really deeply listening to these communities. I think this is part of what's come out of our conversation um, is that, you know, to go in with all our science, technology and data and to, you know, as Jebel was saying, already have the answer to help you is just, it's actually led to much worse problems. And so um, I just, I, I think it's worth thinking about how to be respectful and what respect means and, and what dignity means. I'm still processing the last question because I struggle with this a lot in terms of neocolonialism and international development and what our history is as a government um, with other countries and how we have affected the resources of other countries. And now we're coming in with funds saying here, build, your, build yourself up in this way with these resources that we're providing you after a history, a history of taking resources from other countries. And so recognizing that history is I think really important and we should always be mindful of that in our work. And I guess with that, my, my parting thoughts are, we aren't so disparate in all of our attempts, you know, and we're all very much connected in this together. And that kind of relates to my origin story, which you know, um, whether I was working as a social worker, um, you know, implementing, or whether I'm working at the policy level or more of that macro programmatic level, um, or for that matter, uh, in terms of multi-sectoral work, it's all very connected and we have to be mindful of that and, and work together to, to make some real progress. I'll jump in. Um, I, I also am still thinking about these last a couple of questions. It's still, I think I'll be thinking about it for a while. Um, but something I've heard around 
the agency, USAID, and, and other spaces. And I, I still don't know who to attribute this quote to, but it, it really is impactful. And I think it resonates with what we've been talking about, um, nothing about us without us, or some, I may not be getting that exactly right, um, but uh, you get what I'm saying. And I think that's a really incredible, incredibly powerful um, quote. Um, and, and to the extent that we can all think about that in, in, in the work that we do, um, and also that there, I really do hope just listening to this conversation and, and the series, just the, the motivation for the series, um, that it'd be great if there were more linkages just between science and the humanities um, in general. Uh, you know, these storytelling, um, data, you know, quanti quantifiable concepts around empowerment. Like there's so many interlinkages and in this world of like, so much data that's overwhelming and so much information, um, the extent to which we can start building bridges across disciplines, across ideas, across, you know, like I said, gen generally the science and the humanities, I think a lot of the impact of our work and our ideas um, will, will be more sustainable. Yeah. I think, oh my goodness, I have lots of thoughts <laughs> um, and really appreciate the discussion and, and all the questions. Um, I think really my, my last thing I want to say is how important women's movements are and women's rights activism in, in all of its flourishing, messy diversity around the world and getting money to women. I'll say the problem with data for me is that it tells a story of despair, right? Especially around climate, it tells a story of despair. And one of the things that it, the things that is most powerful around the story of of adding gender, of centering gender, is that that's a story about a future, right? That's a it's a science fiction story, right? That's a story you can tell about environment that ends up in a good place, that isn't a disaster, that isn't that tells the data. And I think the more we can tell those stories of sort of not necessarily utopias, but utopian attempts to breach those utopias and the gender story is that story. I think the more effective we'll be at the other stuff. And so that's my hope that we don't just tell the sky's falling story, which we can tell, but that there's a there's a gender story and, and, and a human rights story that we can tell that gets us beyond the apocalypse. To a world where girls are climbing trees. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. This has been so amazing. And I know each week coming into these conversations that we don't know how things are going to unfold. And that feels a little scary and also a little bit exciting, kind of like Kate's theater days. <laughs> but um, it's the conversation has surpassed um, our imaginings and our expectations. I, I thought that interesting things would unfold when we all got together, but I didn't know what. And it's been really delightful and wonderful to talk with you all. Thank you for sharing your stories, your histories. I'm hopeful that for students and practitioners um, alike who might be new to these ideas and to these fields, that it, that it can serve as a sort of inspiration after a year that's been really difficult. So thank you. We have our fourth and final um, roundtable in this series next week. So same time, same place, um, starting at 3.35 on Thursday afternoon. Next week, we're going to be talking about peace. We've got our mayor here in Dayton giving opening remarks and another amazing group of um, folks from the community level to big picture policy people. So it should um, be another fascinating conversation where we bring up really interesting ideas and see what unfolds. So hope you all can join um, to discuss that um, issue. And we will sign off now a couple minutes late, but for a good conversation and a good cause. So thank you all. Take care. Go climb some trees. <laughs>